My name is Miles Baker, and I'm the executive director of the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. It's my pleasure to introduce you to this feature program of TCAF 2022, presented by Seneca College School of Creative Arts and Animation. For the next hour, it is my hope that you will be delighted as I was watching this intimate conversation between Neil Gaiman and his longtime friend, Mark Asquith. Neil Gaiman is the author of many books, including the graphic novels, Sandman, Chivalry, Violent Cases, and many, many more. We were able to catch him on his latest book tour while also supervising post-production on the upcoming Sandman television series. In his book, View from the Cheap Seats, Neil described Mark Asquith as the secret master of science fiction. Mark is a writer and producer living in Toronto. His writing credits have appeared from publishers such as DC, Amish Comics, and Spider Baby Graphics. Mark broke into television projects with Prisoners of Gravity at TVO and was a founding producer of the Space Channel. In 2018, uh, he was awarded the TM Maple Award at the Joe Schuster's for his many efforts in bringing comics to Canadians. Before I hand things over to Mark, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land that TCAP is hosted. The original caretakers of this land are the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit, First Nation, Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples. The festival is hosted in territory that was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wham Bum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations to share and care for the land. We also acknowledge that this area is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. TCAF makes this acknowledgement as a reminder that we are all treaty people and we have a responsibility to take care of the land and each other. TCAF has also committed to increasing Indigenous voices throughout its program this year and beyond. It's now my pleasure to hand things over to Mark. So take it away. Welcome, Neil. Great to see you. One of the things that you and I are passionate about is libraries. And one of the reasons that I wish you were at TCAF this year is TCAF is held in one of the most beautiful libraries in the world uh, in downtown Toronto. Why are libraries so important to you? I think libraries are so important to me because personally, libraries have proved important to me. And then I extrapolate and I talk to people. So on, on a personal level, I was a library kid. Um, for me, during my school holidays, I would talk my parents into dropping me off at the library on their way to work. The library was about a mile and a half away from my house. And uh, I love the fact that looking back on it, nobody ever really questioned whether or not I had any food or anything, which I normally didn't. I think my dad once talked me into taking sandwiches, which I thought was an incredible imposition. And then I had to go out into the car park and sit and eat my sandwiches. It was such a ridiculous thing to do that I just never bothered again. I would be dropped off. Uh, nine o'clock in the morning, I'd be there when the library opened, I would head back into the children's area, sit and read my way through the shelves. Um, they had an old fashioned card catalog. And I would just go to the card catalog, look up witches, or look up folk tales, look up robots, look up space, look up anything I cared about, look up scary and just go and pull the books down. And as soon as I discovered an author I loved, I would read everything by that author. Um, so that was, you know, eventually I, I'd actually read my way through the entire children's library and started on the adult library. And my, my because they didn't have a subject index, I tried just starting at A and that didn't work very well. Um, adult libraries, I discovered you can't read your way through an alphabetical order, but it, well, I did, did try. And for me, dealing with adults who would listen to me when they're talking to a seven-year-old or a nine-year-old, and I'm getting to order books through them on the interlibrary system, just things they didn't have, or I'm talking to them about where we were trying to figure out I remember who the author of the Alfred Hitchcock's Three Investigators series were 
for ordering some from other libraries so that I could read the entire series. Um, you know, and it, it was a real thing. So for me, libraries were personally important. I wouldn't be who I am now if I hadn't have had those libraries. Um, and then later, um, as a young journalist, libraries became the places I did my research. Libraries became places that you could go to a library and work, and it didn't cost you anything. And when you are a very, very broke, young wannabe journalist, wannabe writer, or even just becoming writer, that was important too. Um, the idea that these were safe spaces was huge, and safe spaces that valued and curated knowledge. Um, and then I moved to America, and one of the people I would always talk to were librarians, and started to realize what I hadn't realized when younger, which is how much librarians do, how much they're responsible for. Um, and also the way that things have changed. Now we're in a world in which so much is online. And if you are not personally online, um, how do you go and look for jobs? How do you fill in job applications? How do you get into the system? And how do you get into the system if all of this stuff is challenging for you? Um, the places that help people like that are libraries. Um, the places that give kids after school a safe place to go do schoolwork um, is libraries. The place that you very, and they also do outreach to communities. They will have meetings of interest groups, of reading groups, of all sorts of things. There, there are so many things. And then they defend literacy. And, um, you know, librarians, what I love is that they tend to be united wherever they are on the political spectrum by a belief that knowledge is important, access to information is important, um, and needs to be defended. So again, I get evangelical about libraries. Um, they are, and, and I truly think they are the best of humanity. Um, this is what, um, let me go just for a moment out into sort of giant big picture. Take a human being, a random human being dropped on the desert island without much in the way of education or interaction with other human beings, you have somebody who will probably die. Maybe they'll stay alive. It would be good if they stayed alive. Um, what they're not going to be doing is being part of a civilization. What they don't have access to is the knowledge of thousands upon thousands of years of accumulated people going out making mistakes, recording their mistakes, coming up with ideas, seeing the world, recording that, passing that on. And the reason why I get to be in a fancy hotel room that looks a lot like a set right now um, is because knowledge has been passed on because we are more than individuals. We have actually access to information, to learn and mistakes. We aren't instinctive. We are not born as ants are knowing how to, you know, build ant hills or whatever. We, we come into this fairly fresh and we have libraries and and libraries as shared information, libraries as places of, that can actually say, this is good information, 
this information over here is not really information. It looks a lot like information, um, but that's just like, you know, the toadstools that will kill you that look a lot like mushrooms. Actually, the stuff here, you know, that's not in the library because it's dangerous. Here, these things are mushrooms. And I think that's important too, just having somebody curating your information. Um, we've been talking a lot about kind of things in general, and now I want to focus down on comics, because of course this is the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. So throughout your career, you've really explored what comics can do in terms of narrative and visuals. What do you love so much about the medium? Um, the power. I love the way that comics unite us in an experience, um, but allow us a level of control over the experience that we lack in television and in film. Um, which is to say that pure prose is a kind of magic. It's like telepathy. I write words you read the words, or you listen to the words, um, or you braille like touch the words, and you get that information, and your brain decodes it, unfolds it, and builds worlds and people out of it. Um, but the people that it builds are not necessarily consistent people. My Let's see, my Severian in the Book of the New Sun is not necessarily your Severian in the Book of the New Sun. My Smoky Barnable from Little Big is not necessarily your Smoky Barnable. Um, you know, just picking two books at random. Um, comics and, and film gives us a shared experience. You know, if I sit there and watch Killing Eve, I am seeing the same Killing Eve out on the road, wherever I am, that you are in Toronto. Um, you know, I saw the same classic Star Trek that you saw, or the same Doctor Who. And that's shared, but I have no real control over it. I experience it as a viewer. Comics? exist on a magical intersection of image and word where as a reader i'm both building the story i'm creating it i'm a co-creator um combining the word balloons with 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 the the gaps between the panels to build a story. I'm taking what exists and the beauty of what exists, and I am building a story along with you. Um, and a story that I can go back and check things on. I can, you know, there, there are, I thought it was really interesting when I was show running the first season of Good Omens and I was in the edit with Douglas Kinnan, who directed them and who has become my co-showrunner for season two and director. Um, because I would say to Douglas, you know, I, I do something in the edit and Douglas would go, they'll never get that. Um, I'd say, well, they won't get it on the first viewing they might not get it on the second, but on the third or the fourth, they'll notice that. And Douglas was just like, nobody watches television three or four times. You don't build television to be watched three or four times. You have to give it to them all on the first viewing. And I'm like, well, you know, I think they're going to watch this more than once. And I'm hoping they'll get it then. Um, and Douglas, you know, there are many things on season one I've gone to Douglas on and said, you know, you, you were right on that. And I was completely wrong. But that's one thing that Douglas has come to me and said, you were absolutely right. They just, there are people who watch Good Omens weekly. Um, and I'm like, yeah, I, I thought so. Because 
I learned when building Sandman that you could build things that were not ever expected to, to reveal everything on first read. Um, possibly not even on second read, but the third time you went through having the story in your head and details in your head, you could suddenly go, oh, that, that's that guy who shows up here. Oh my God, that's that, that thing. That's where that lands. I hadn't realized. This For me, thing. the first one to kind of do that was Watchmen. And then one of the things that I thought was so much fun in Sandman was that you clearly had learned from what Watchmen was doing. And, um, but there are things like the, the bottle from Ramadan shows up issues way before Ramadan shows up at issue 50. And I remember not noticing that until I was rereading it. And I suddenly went, there's the bottle, which is kind of a really nice kind of pre-Easter egg. I don't know what we call those, but it was like one of those wonderful, delightful, oh, that's great. You know, that's a really le motif or a nice kind of setup for what was to follow. You know, if you go back to that panel, you'll see Prez's watch sitting there as well. That's what you see, because there is a lot of stuff that you you tend to miss. Um, as you were working on, um, well, let's, so if we're gonna get into Sandman as we are, one of the things that fascinated, like when you got into Sandman, it was a monthly comic. So you had to stay to that um, rhythm, uh, you know, production rhythm, if, if you will. What kind of influence did it being a monthly comic have on the kind of stories you realized that you wanted to tell? I think the best thing about having to write a monthly comic was I didn't know if I could write a monthly comic. And so the biggest influence it had was starting out. I had to build for myself a for want of a better word a storytelling machine that would allow me to go absolutely anywhere and tell any kind of story because i didn't know if i could do it what i did know is that if i was doing essentially a monster of the month comic or something like that I would get very bored very quickly. So coming up with Sandman, the idea of an immortal being who had existed from the dawn of time um, meant that I went, okay, well, I have the entirety of human history and pre-human history as a playground, should I need it. Um, the idea of Morpheus meant that I, I had stories, I had dreams, I had history, I had, I wasn't limited to one thing. And yes, I could go and do horror, but I could do a lot of other things as well. And that was there in the initial plan. And that was there because I'd never done this. I hadn't written a monthly comic. Um, at the point where I was commissioned to write Sandman, I'd written, I'd had published maybe four short stories. I'd had, um, you know, I'd done violent cases, some outrageous tales in the Old Testament, a handful of future shocks, um, and Black Orchid. And that was my comics output at that point. So, I think that was the biggest thing, was just going, okay, I, I'm gonna have to build this thing that will let me go anywhere because I, I have no idea how to do this and I don't know what I'm doing. So, but I do know that I get bored easily. And I do know that trying to do the same thing over and over, I will, I will leave. I'll do it for a little bit and then I'll stop. So I have to be in a position of being able to just keep myself entertained. It's interesting too, because I, 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 I'd like to talk about a specific panel 
that um, um, when you you showed me some stuff from from the the television show coming up from Netflix, and it's the panel that's the splash page from the first issue called Sleep of the Just, and it's Sandman with the helmet on. That that to me is such an iconic uh, image of Sandman. Why did you want to start there, and what what kind of what was what's that about, and why do you think it's become such a lasting image? Uh, in Sandman? Um, I wanted to start there. Um, I mean, that was page eight of the first issue and, and you'll find it probably about, I don't know, 10, 12 minutes in to episode one of, um, of the Netflix Sandman. Because what was important was having no idea what Morpheus really looked like. Um, we haven't seen the the image that powered the first issue was the idea of a naked man in a glass box taken prisoner and outliving his captors. Um, just being prepared, something so long lived that he could wait until one day he could get out. And I knew that the first um, storyline was going to be the pouch, the ruby, and the helm, which meant that I wanted to put them right there up front. I wanted them to be very explicit. And I also wanted you to see this Thing that could be alien. I didn't want you to look and go, aha, this is, you know, this is our good looking hero or whatever. I wanted you to go, what, what is that? And um, so that really was, was why that image was important. Um, one thing that's been very important to me and Alan Heinberg, to the directors, to the production designers on Sandman, the television series, is using the comics, um, is going back and going, this moment is iconic. This is a real thing. We need, we need to do that. And that hasn't been, I should say, me pushing them to do that. That's been everybody going, how do we do this? We love these comics. Um, you know, the point, the point I relaxed, there's a moment in um, the, the first issue where you see some, the guards who are guarding the glass cage and one of them is reading a copy of the Sun newspaper and the headline is tug of love baby eaten by cows. And um, the moment where they were walking me through the props room, and I was very impressed by the helmet. I was very impressed by the bag of sand and the ruby and all of the things they showed me. But it was coming to a copy of the sun, and the headline was "Tug of Love Baby Eaten by Cows," and I just thought, "Okay, you guys, you really are making sand man." Aren't you? One of the things that is so fascinating to me about Sandman is that you use different artists for different arcs. And um, that really, uh, I think oh, in many ways opened things up. I don't know if it opened things up for you as, 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 a, as the writer, but it certainly for me as the reader was really one of those unexpected things. Um, you didn't know what the next issue would be. So why did you choose certain artists for certain arcs? For example, Charles Vest doing the wonderful award-winning story that he did. So first of all, that wasn't the initial plan. Nobody had ever done that before. The plan was Sam Keith and Mike Dringenberg as an art team, and we would have done the whole of, of Sam Man together, you know, like Steve Dillon on Preacher or whatever. It, it just would have been one artist. Um, Sam was miserable. Basically, wound up. I remember he called me around um, 
issue three and just said, I am in the wrong band. I feel like, like Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles. I need to not do this. And I'm like, okay. Mike took over. Um, and again, the idea was Mike was going to be the artist. But Mike also wanted to do other things. And, um, and when Mike decided to do um, another project, when we got to Season of Mists, where we'd already had some other people doing what were meant to be fill-ins, and Mike basically just wound up top and tailing it with Kelly Jones in the middle, at that point, we realized that we had a whole new way of doing things. And it had evolved. It was basically accidental. Um, but having evolved, the idea that we could get individual artists in for, um, for single issue stories and then find if we could one artist who matched up with a larger storyline um that you know it, it became sandman it became one of the hallmarks of sandman and it was not intentional charles bass um charlie and i he'd been one of my favorite artists i'd first encountered him in terms of interacted in a way that we'd come across each other's radars um on an Amazing Heroes swimsuit issue. Amazing Heroes was a sort of the, like the junior comics journal of its time. And they did, as a kind of a wonderful joke, a swimsuit issue once a year. And he did the Warriors 3 from Thor playing in the sand and building a, a figure out of sand and he put at the bottom something about it being a tribute to James Branch Cabell and an author I love and, and his work Figures of Earth. And somebody at Amazing Heroes had captioned it with, you know, Charles Vess paying tribute to one of his favorite illustrators. And so I wrote a letter to Amazing Heroes explaining who James Branch Cabell was and the significance of Figures of Earth. And uh, so Charles, read that letter and knew who I was, which meant that at the 1989 San Diego Comic Convention, which was my first big American convention, I think Sandman 8 had just come out. Um, I met Charles and we, we liked each other. Um, and I, there wasn't a plan to work together at that point. There was just a small mutual admiration society. I think because of my letter or because he met me, he started reading Sandman. And because I started saying, I think, you know, I'd, I'd love you to do something and discovered that he liked it. I think he hadn't picked it up initially because he thought it was horror and Charles Vesses don't like horror, but he loved whatever Sandman was. Um, and then I had his donning Starblaze illustrated Midsummer Night's Dream already. After I wrote Sandman 13 from Michael Zilli, I knew that I was going to be doing Midsummer Night's Dream one day in the Tempest one day and got in touch with Charles and just said, I want you to draw Midsummer Night's Dream, would you do that? And he, he said yes. And uh, I was the luckiest boy in the world on that one. And it was the hardest issue to get through. And I remember while I was writing it, basically beginning the script with a little thing that said, okay, this is either going to be the one they always remember and it's going to win awards and it's going to be loved or it's going to go down in history as one of the great missteps of comics and when comics fans get together 
and they'll say, you know, you think the Hulk versus the Thing 3D pop-up comic was a stupid idea. What about the Game and Vest Midsummer Extreme? And that will top everything. And I knew it was going to be one or the other. Karen, my editor, didn't know Shakespeare from Sausages and didn't really know what I was doing. So it was the only script I ever handed in on Sandman where she was just like, I don't see what the emotional heart of this story is. You have to, you have to change it. And out of 75 issues of Sandman that Karen edited, it was the only one she ever sent me back to do any kind of rewrite on that ever went to essentially second draft editorially guided and she just said I don't know what the emotional heart of this is please you have to find that for me and I wound up rewriting and writing essentially the scene with Hamnet Shakespeare's son backstage just talking about his emotionally distanced dad and how everything that happened happened in a story and that you know if something happened to Hamnet, his dad would just write a play and call it Hamnet. And um, of course, Hamnet would die and, and Hamlet was written. Um, so I, I wrote that page. And I think that page is the heart of that script. And, and it was magic. And, and we got very, very lucky. We got Steve Olaf's beautiful magical coloring steve just did amazing things um we you know charles it was the issue charles was born to draw we won the world fantasy award they changed the rules so nobody could ever win the world fantasy award for best short story for a comic ever again that it was too late it was kind of like you know, closing the stable door after the horse had already got out and won the Kentucky Derby. Um, and, uh, you know, the rest is history. I, I want to talk about another artist now and another, another project. This is actually uh, Chivalry by the great, uh, great Colleen Duran. And uh, you and I, you've collaborated with her before, both in Sandman and on uh, one of the short stories, uh, Snow Glass Apples. Tell me about Chivalry and how, you know, why you wanted her to be the person to illustrate this. You know, Colleen, I loved Colleen's work. Um, I met Colleen, she was on some kind of tour of the DC offices as part of something incredibly unlikely. You'd have to, now, I, now, you know, in my memory, it was something like the United Nations or something. For some reason, a bunch of comics people or artists or whatever from the United Nations were on a tour of the DC offices. And Colleen was one of them. And I got to go over to her and she got to come over to me and, and just say, you know, she's like, I'm Colleen, I love your stuff. I love Sandman. I'm like, oh my God, I love your stuff. I'd seen, um, I hadn't seen A Distant Soil yet, but I'd seen a backup story that she did in Cerebus. And I just went, oh my gosh, this, I love her storytelling. I love, you know, her, her people. And I said, would you draw a Sandman? And she said yes. So she came and draw, drew um, facade, Sandman 20, and, um, and came back again in the game of you and did an issue and would come and do pinups and things. And when I wrote um, Chivalry, the short story, I faxed it to her because that was how we all communicated back in those long gone days. We faxed things. And I faxed her um, the story. And she called me up and just said, I love this. I would love to, you know, oh my God, I see it in my head. It would make an amazing comic. 
and at the time it wasn't the kind of thing that you could have got published as a comic and we weren't really thinking about it i uh, by the uh by the end of the 90s it had been bought by a film company who had exercised an option in a sneaky kind of way and i no longer had the rights to it so i loved the idea of it becoming a comic and back then it could have become a comic but i didn't have the ability to get it turned into a comic and about four years ago the person who had optioned it wound up essentially uh going to jail and i got the rights back i was managed, managed to reclaim the rights to my short story that i thought long gone forever and um colleen who had never let go of the idea that one day i would get the rights back and she would do chivalry um said okay this is my time and what she did i think was magic one of the things that i'm amazed by on, on Troll Bridge, on Snow Glass Apples, and now on Chivalry, is the way she reinvents the form very quietly in a, in a very non flashy, non splashy, non in your face kind of way. She reinvents comics. Um, and and I, I say that as if she's not being noticed for it. You know, the, the, she won all of the awards for Snow Glass Apples. Um, because I think people realized what she was doing and her, her, her peers as artists got to look at this and go, this is astonishing work. Um, I think chivalry is even more astonishing. This is hand painted. This is, um, this is this amazing, beautiful thing that reminds me um, at times of Pauline Baines's Lord of the Rings posters and, and Narnia posters and covers. Um, and, but, you know, it's so beautiful, classical, magical stuff. Um, and some of them feel like tapestries. I mean, it just, it, she's, yeah, the form just feels like she's found a new way to kind of play with time and play with, um, I don't know what to call it, kind of a dynamic energy. I think, you know, Colleen has been a survivor. She's, when she started doing comics, um, there really weren't that many women drawing comics. Um, there weren't many women writing comics. There were, it was an incredibly male field. And she came into it. She's outlasted people who were appalling to her. She's been amazing. And she's also doing better work now than she has ever done in her life. And she started off really good. I mean, you know, you look at some of these splash pages in chivalry, they could be posters, they could be tapestries, they could be giant paintings. Um, all I know is they're outstandingly beautiful. Um, we've been talking a lot about collaboration and, and your work has been adapted to audio, stage, film. What are your boundaries in regards to adaptation? How do you mean? Well, how much do you give to your collaborator? How much do you keep to yourself and say no why this is how i feel you should do it because my sense is that that has changed with someone like colleen it feels to me like you just said you do your thing i trust you i know you can do it and with other people i feel that there is the specter of neil gaiman looming behind them saying no no you have to do it this way i think the key word is trust and i also think these days trust has to be earned um so but I also think you have to be able to trust your collaborators. So I, with, with the Dark Horse line of adaptations of my stories, 
of which Colleen's chivalry is one. Um, there's been different amounts of collaboration with different artists and different adapters. Um, sometimes, you know, when I'm working with somebody like Craig Russell or like Colleen, I absolutely trust them to get on with it. I know that if they have questions, they'll come to me. Colleen and I, before she started Chivalry, um, had fabulous long conversations where I would go online and find her reference photos of England in the late 80s, England in the 1950s. I talk about, you know, people, people get times wrong in production design a lot and in comics because they'll go, what did a kitchen look like in 1989? And they'll go and find pictures of kitchens in 1989 that were installed in 1989. And you're going, well, actually, this is a house she's been living in since the 1950s. You're gonna have a 1950s kitchen that's been updated a little bit. She probably got a new fridge at some point. Um, but even that would be a 1970s fridge rather than uh, you know, that's because people don't reinvent all of their property and belongings every year to take account of the time. They, they do things and then they last through time. Um, so I was finding her those, finding her British streets, finding her the literal, um, you know, we went on Google Maps and found photographs of the house in Parkstone Avenue that my grandmother had lived in, which I turned into Mrs. Whitaker's house in my head, um, even though I'd moved Mrs. Whitaker, you know, 70 miles north and, and east, all of that kind of stuff, so that she could have that. But then, so she had all the reference, and then I just let her get on with it, because I wanted to see what she was going to do. With, um, with television stuff, I either do it all myself now and or I work very, very closely with collaborative collaborators. Or sometimes I step completely aside if I trust people or if a long ago deal before I had the amount of power that I have now means that I can't be in control. Um, but there's definitely a level on which I watched when I started out on this stuff, my attitude was because our attitudes are shaped by our contemporaries and mine was very much shaped by Alan Moore, whose attitude was you go and, you know, you do whatever you want with the comic, make your movies or whatever, I'm over here. And I thought that was a very good thing until I started seeing bad adaptations. And then I started seeing how much bad adaptations upset Alan. And that, you know, there were films of his things that he's never gone to see because he doesn't want to be upset. And I thought, well, that would be a, a terrible thing. I would much rather spend the time, even though I could spend the time writing, I would rather spend the time making sure that I'm putting teams of people together that I like and consulting with them and working with them so that the thing is a thing that I like. I love the Coraline movie. Um, in order for the Coraline movie to exist, I had to finish writing Coraline and then have my agent get the novel, this unpublished novel, onto Henry Selleck's desk. And then have patience with Henry and make sure Henry had the rights and controlled it and traveled with Henry for 10 years. Um, but, and you know, at some points there was, there was one point where Henry had basically a six month long free option on it because he'd come so far and 
Disney was swimming around and trying to get it. And now the option had come up and I was like, okay, I really want this Leica thing to happen. And because I knew that Henry could do it. And I'd worked with Henry on the script and got to the point where I was good with the script. And I knew that I was his collaborator. Thank you so much so far. Now I'm gonna turn this over to some of your fans. So we asked a number of your fans that they wanted to ask you. So let's start with Popsicle Emperor. I love that name. Who asked, would you want to be the Sandman? Dear God, no. Um, I definitely wouldn't want to be, you know, whatever it is, 14 billion years old. Um, I, he doesn't really have a sense of humor. He has an outsized sense of responsibility and job. And he has a trail of wrecked relationships behind him and wrecked relationships both in love life and, and for friends and stuff. Um, so I know, I, I mean, I, I hope that I learn better. Um, but You're not going to spend time at Balistrad's looking out. I'm not, I'm not going to stand there for two weeks crying. Um, even though occasionally I'd, I'd love the idea of just spending two weeks on a balcony having a good cry and feeling the rain and feeling really sorry for myself. Um, no, I, I wouldn't. And furthermore, though, what I love right now is that I, I remember reading that Leslie Charteris, who wrote the Saint novels, when Roger Moore became the Saint on the television show, Charteris wrote him a note that said, until now, people have expected me, when meeting me, to meet the Saint. And I hand that to you. You now get to have that. And as far as I'm concerned, now Tom Sturridge gets to, I've spent three decades disappointing people who thought that they were gonna meet Morpheus and just met me. Um, and now I pass that on to Tom Sturridge, who can be the person that people will expect to meet Morpheus and meet Tom instead. Lorenka asks, what kind of torch would you want future cartoonists to carry? Um, I want future cartoonists not to rest on their laurels. I want future cartoonists to learn all they can about the medium. I want them to have read um, everything Will Eisner wrote and did about the medium. I want them to understand the past. I want them to have read and understood understanding comics, for example, Scott McCloud's seminal work. But then I want them to push things forward. I don't want them just to look at the comics of old and go, I could do that. I want them to take comics to new places. And I want them to do stuff that I could not imagine comics could do. That's where I want them to take it. Jay Marshall Smith asks, have you got any advice on how to keep going in the long discouraging stretches in creative work? No, um, other than to say, if you don't keep going during the long discouraging stretches, the thing doesn't get finished. It doesn't get done. It never happens. You always have a choice. You either keep going or you stop. Um, but if you are creative, you know, they say that sharks have to keep moving or they die. Um, and you're a shark, you have to keep moving. So there's always a point where you will find yourself discouraged. There's always a point where you can't see the point in it. There's always a point where you have a bad day and you get up and you look at everything and, you know, with 
with me, you know, I wrote 3,000 pages of Sandman. You cannot believe that every one of those pages was me going, yes, I'm writing Sandman, this is brilliant. An awful lot of them were me going, oh, oh, it's another two people talking and nothing happening scene, and why am I doing this? And it's all awful and nothing's really happening and the readers are just gonna go away. And I know that the, you know, I'm writing the kindly ones and I thought it was gonna be five issues long and I'm now on issue nine and the end seems no nearer. And I have no idea what I'm doing, but I just have to keep going. And, but you keep going. Cause if you don't, no one else is gonna do the work. Elves will not come in the night and finish your novel for you. You can put out all of the glasses of milk for them that you want and they still won't do it. I've tried. So you, so it's just up to you and you get up feeling discouraged and miserable and you write anyway. I find that the elves particularly like single malt scotch, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, at G Pike asks, and I quote, Right now, I would just like to ask him to say something encouraging to trans folks and everyone else who is scared of what is going on in the world. I think we're all scared. Um, I think we're all scared because it felt like the arrow, the direction of the 20th century was towards safety, was towards acceptance was away from the Nazi times, was away from a time of concentration camps where, you know, a lot of Jews died in the concentration camps. Pretty much all of my family did. And gay people died in concentration camps. And the Romani died in concentration camps. And, um, and you know, trans people and the early trans research was destroyed by the Nazis. Um, you know, there, there's, that stuff happened and we thought we'd moved away from it. And I think right now we're realizing that history may not repeat, but it rhymes. History can be cyclical. You're definitely seeing um, a rise in attacks on LGBTA plus people. I left out Q, but you know those arise. Uh, the attacks are happening. Um, Anti-Semitism is happening. Islamophobia is happening. All of this stuff is happening, and it's awful. Um, and I still feel that, yes, things move in pendulum swings, but the giant arrow of history is with us. Um, I think that some genies, once they are out of the bottles, cannot be put back. And I think the world has actually changed. Um, and I'm... And I think that there are people who are very upset with the fact that the world of now is not the world of a hypothetical 1950s. Um, you know, there are people who ever thought that the backstreet abortion industry um, would be, you know, a potential growth and investment industry in America. Um, it was something that was gone. But I still think that the thrust of history is towards individual freedom, um, expression, and I hope it's towards safety. Yeah, I think of all the work that you've done for the refugees and a lot of the spotlight you've tried to place on many of these issues. Uh, um, thank you, thank you on behalf of so many people. And I guess that's a great place for us to wrap this up. Uh, I, um, it was fantastic. I want to thank Team Neil, which is Kat, Leela, and Rachel, 
I want to thank Team TCAF, uh, Miles, Jalen, and Pip. And of course, a big thanks to you, Neil, without whom this wouldn't have happened. So thank you very much for joining us. I have loved having long, strange, on-camera conversations with you for well over three decades now, Mark. And it's always fun. And I hope I didn't rabbit on too much. And I would say that I, I was doing some research and I see that uh, in uh, on one of your blogs, you said, and on this tour, I will be interviewed uh, many times and many of them will be Mark Asquith. <laughs> Which I don't know if that talks about my interviewing style or just the fact that the way the world works, we kept running into each other, but there you go. But thanks again. And uh, I, hope, uh, I hope we can catch up soon and I hope we can get you to a TCAF sometime in the near future. I would love that. I hope you enjoyed that feature presentation for TCAF 2022. Before we go, I'd like to once again thank our programming sponsor, Seneca College School of Creative Arts and Animation. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Art Council, and the Toronto Art Council for their generous support. Special thanks, of course, to the Beguiling Books and Art. I hope you enjoyed the time. Thank you so much for it, and we'll see you again soon.